generous introduction. And it's, it's very nice to see here some old colleagues from Foreign Affairs, Les included, and Ian Nicholson, and also Dr. Peter Edwards, the official historian of the Vietnam War, and also my old colleague uh, Jim Short, with whom I worked together a long time ago, and then Jim went on, went on to more lofty things into the federal parliament as a federal minister, and he's carried on with other links with China and elsewhere. Diplomats like to tell the story of the foreign minister who had too much to drink at a diplomatic reception in Lima in Peru. When music began, the foreign minister saw a beautiful woman in purple on the other side of the room. He crossed the floor and invited her to waltz. The minister was taken aback when the personage in purple refused his invitation. He boldly asked why. He was promptly told, firstly, you are drunk. <coughs> Secondly, this is not a waltz, but the Peruvian national anthem. <laughs> and thirdly, I happen to be the apostolic nuncio to Peru. <laughs> <laughs> this story is based on fact. <laughs> the minister was Britain's Foreign Secretary George Brown. A broader point of the story is that ministers have choices. As a relatively young diplomat in 1973, I was asked to join the party of the first Australian Prime Minister to visit China. As was his custom, Mr Whitlong took with him to China an exceptionally large official party. And I was the junior in a strong team. We knew the Prime Minister would be welcomed warmly, but no one was prepared for the breathtaking reception at Beijing Airport. More than 10,000 brightly dressed school children waved coloured flags and ribbons and chanted a welcome as the large party emerged from the plane. A band played Advance Australia Fair, click go the shears, and Walsing Matilda. <laughs> Thousands of people, smiling and waving, lined the streets as we drove into Beijing. The Chinese leadership wanted to make a spectacular gesture of approval to mark the first official visit to China by an Australian head of government. The carnival atmosphere was grandly celebratory, but totally unreal. At the time, China was still substantially closed with the Cultural Revolution still running its course. The Chinese economy was in a total mess, and Mao's great leap forward had fallen flat on its face. Yet he was an ailing communist state, pulling out all stops for the leader of what it surely knew was a broadly conservative capitalist country. My role was very modest, uh, helping negotiate wheat and sugar deals and helping Dick Wilcock negotiate the press communique. Every member of the party met the remarkably clever Chinese Premier, Tsai Lai. <coughs> the man who, when asked what he thought of the French Revolution, replied, it was still too early to tell. <laughs> <laughs> Whitlam insisted on meeting the frail Chairman Mao Zedong on his own. And as his foreign affairs advisers, Dick Wook and I were excluded from this meeting. We were asked to remain behind in the VIP compound. And after the meeting, we asked the Prime Minister how he found Chairman Mao. Comrades, Whitler remarked. He always called us comrades. I asked Mao what would have happened if instead of President Kennedy, President Khrushchev had been assassinated. Whitlam said that after reflection, Chairman Mao replied, Prime Minister, one thing is certain. Aristotle Anassas would not have married Mrs. Khrushchev. <laughs> <laughs> Dick very quickly said, you made that up, Prime Minister. <laughs> and it was some time, it was really a long time, before Whitman admitted that he had. For Mao was senile and barely coherent. I've been to China several times since. I've been privileged to spend eight years living in three countries of Europe, in Britain, France, and the headquarters of the European community in Brussels, two years in the United States, and over six years in two predominantly Islamic countries, Indonesia and Bangladesh. I've also been fortunate to visit over 70 countries in the course of my work. From all this travel, an outstanding impression <coughs> is how well Australia is regarded overseas. 
We are respected as a successful country. We are recognised for achievement, not just in sport, but in law, medicine, music, novels, and highly competent military forces. Australians generally are regarded as a warm and friendly people. The British love to beat us, if they can, at rugby and cricket, and alas, we've given them something to celebrate in recent times, and many like to rib us. But for many among the well-informed in Britain, and I say this after my time there, I'm meeting a lot of them, after the United States, Australia is perceived as the most successful country spawned by Britain. The distinguished novelist David Maloof has written, I believe accurately, that the British see in Australia a free aversion of what might have been possible to their own manner of doing things. One that is organised and efficient, but doesn't take itself too seriously, in which display and a justified pride in achievement is continually undercut by a larky, self-deprecating wit. When the British look at us now, what they are seeing is another and different version of themselves, themselves caught up in a new light under new and warmer skies. Americans relate well to Australians. Those who know us like us, but as a well-traveled audience like this, I don't need to say, most Americans don't know a great deal about Australia. Many are poorly informed. Yet in America, you will rarely encounter anything but goodwill towards Australia and Australians. The French have a jaundiced view of the English, but they don't extend that to us. The Japanese have a positive view of Australia, and so do, do the Chinese. In Indonesia, we're not loved, but we're respected as a successful country. Those in government know we are a serious player in regional security, trade and investment. They know that the Australian Federal Police did a remarkable job with their technology, their understanding of mobile phones and other aspects of their skills in tracking down the Bali bombers. And they know that our government and people were exceptionally generous after the Boxing Day tsunami. Even among the vast mass of Indonesians living a hundred existence in rural areas, hundreds of thousands, indeed millions, still listen to Radio Australia. They appreciate the independent news and commentary they have heard in their own language. A recent Lowy Institute poll in Indonesia found that Australia was highly regarded as a country that can be trusted to act responsibly. The world thinks Australia has negotiated the political, economic and strategic challenges of the last 60 years with great skill. International respect for the quality of Australia's achievements, including our role in international affairs, has unquestionably increased. And the reasons for this go far beyond foreign and strategic policy. Australia has accepted 7 million migrants in 60 years. There's no parallel in the rest of the world for immigration on this scale. The numbers are relatively greater than the numbers who came to the United States in the 19th century. And politicians on both sides have shown impressive leadership. If Menzies had held a referendum in the 1950s seeking agreement for the entry of vast numbers of Italian, Greek, Dutch, German and Baltic migrants, I doubt whether it would have passed. If Fraser had sought agreement at referendum for the admission of large numbers of Vietnamese migrants, I was sure that that would not have been accepted. And similarly, if Hawke had sought public agreement for the admission of large numbers of Chinese students after the Tiananmen massacre, that too would have been unlikely to be approved. Seven million migrants from 140 countries have enriched our culture, enhanced our knowledge and acceptance of other peoples and garnered international respect. But my point is this, immigration has not changed in any way, not changed one whit, our fundamental system of governance, our system of law, or our ideas of liberty and democracy. A second reason why our standing in the world is increased is the way we've opened our economy to globalization. Hawke and Keating's decision to float the Australian dollar was probably the most important economic decision taken in the last 60 years. Tariffs have been lowered. John Howard introduced a GST, and the central bank was given control of monetary policy. Our ex enhanced exposure to the world economy 
has affected every industry, every profession, indeed every aspect of Australian life. It's the reason we wrote out the Asian financial crisis of the 1990s and are writing out, with notable resilience, the current extended global financial crisis. <coughs> A third factor, I probably should have listened to this first, influencing our international standing is the strength of our institutions, our system of parliamentary democracy, our courts, our judiciary, and our financial institutions. And I add, the prudential controls on our financial institutions have proved more robust than those of larger countries. There are also deeper influences at play. David Malouf has written perceptively of what he refers to as the distinctively Australian habit of mind, which is flexible, experimental, adaptive, and scornful of all those traps it sees inhabit and rule. It's the habit of mind that created the common law, devised the British parliamentary system, and gave Britain its head start in the new scientific age and the industrial revolution that grew out of it. It was very largely the language we inherited late Enlightenment English that created that peculiar mildness of social interaction here that has for more than two centuries now kept all kinds of extremism beyond the possibility of acceptable public discourse and the worst sorts of violence at bay. Now all this by way of background to foreign policy. <coughs> When I joined the diplomatic service, Australia's foreign policy was dominated by our relations with Britain and the United States. Our links with Asia were modest and the white Australia policy held sway. And parenthetically, women were second class citizens and indigenous Australians were treated as social outcasts and religious divisions permeated social life. Now half a century later, many of the restrictions and divisions in our society have been vigorously addressed. <coughs> Ancient barriers to women's career have been dismantled, perhaps not totally, but more quickly here than in most other societies. There's an emerging respect for indigenous culture and religious tolerance has become a valued ideal. Over this same period, our foreign and trade policy has come of age. For some time, we've been a player in our own right. <coughs> Excuse me. Just to deal briefly with Britain, I was part of Australia's negotiating team when Britain was seeking to join the EEC. It took quite a while for Australian leaders to realise that Britain was not going to protect Australian interests. Indeed, that Britain's interests were very different from ours and that we had to fight hard on our own. We then had to develop new markets elsewhere to replace what we were losing because of rampant protectionism in Europe. The British did us a favour by joining the European Union. They may not think so now, but they certainly did us a favour. After Britain joined Europe and withdrew its forces from Asia, we forged stronger links with our region and became more confident in our nationalism. The relationship with Britain settled into a new equilibrium, no longer dependent, yet still extraordinarily deep and very strong. While discarding our dependence on Britain was important, much more important has been our success in building substantial government-to-government -government relations with the major countries of Asia, China, Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Vietnam, and to a lesser extent, India. In his book, There Goes the Neighbourhood, Michael Wesley argues that Australian governments and diplomats have thought hard about how to wield influence in only two places, Washington and international organisations. All other relationships have been handled, he argues, with little thought and less ambition. Wesley's book is important, and he's a talented man, but on this, his judgment is wrong, and he's poorly informed. Today, we benefit from an extraordinary relationship with China. It seems hard to remember that until 1972, our formal position was that China did not exist, or more strictly, that Taiwan was the government of all China. <coughs> all Prime Ministers from Whitlam to Howard and since have been focused on China. China is our biggest trading partner, taking a quarter of all exports. 
Australian governments have had to take the lead since in China, the Chinese government makes the running in every core activity. Howard gave special attention to expanding the trade and investment relationship with China and took a significantly different policy to the United States. Howard emphatically concluded Australia could both develop a substantial economic relationship with China without diverting in any way from our strong alliance relationship with the US. Indeed, he strengthened the alliance. But it was Whitlam who initiated the change in policy to China and restored balance to our foreign policy. He put a ceremonial seal at the end of the previous fiction whereby the government in Taipei was regarded as the government of all China. For Australia, it was the beginning of a remarkable change. Japan's another instance where our political leaders have been ahead of public opinion. <coughs> a very important development before I came to government was the bilateral trade agreement forged by John McEwan. When he was Prime Minister, Howard surprised many Australians when he said, I believe correctly, that Japan is Australia's closest friend in Asia. Japan is the Asian country most likely to support Australian political and strategic initiatives. This hasn't happened by just by accident, a succession of distinguished ambassadors, including Jeff Miller, Vice President of this Institute, contributed substantially to the situation. I was fortunate to work closely with Gareth Evans in changing Australia's relationship with Indonesia. If I may digress for a moment, the most significant Australian foreign ministers in the past 60 years have been Percy Spender and Gareth Evans. And saying that, I don't wish to denigrate uh, Alexander Downer, who was a good foreign minister. Anyone who can last 11 and a half years as foreign minister is extraordinarily competent. Spender's achievements on Australia's behalf in negotiating the ANZUS Treaty and inaugurating the Colombo Plan of Assistance to Asian Pacific countries were outstanding. Evans' achievement in transforming Australia's hitherto fragile relationship <coughs> with our largest neighbour, Indonesia, and in bringing peace to Cambodia, for which he was nominated for the Nobel Prize, were of the highest order. Evans, in the early 1990s, dramatically changed Australia's political, commercial and strategic relationship with Indonesia. Keating, <coughs> Howard and Downer subsequently made important contributions, but it was Evans who had the substance and ballast <coughs> that made later achievements possible. I hope we're not losing enthusiasm for this vital relationship. <coughs> While the relationship needs more work, it's not correct to describe it as a foreign policy failure, as Fergus Hansen of the Lowy Institute has done. <coughs> Though it's true, there was one recent, conspicuous, egregious failure. The current government supporting decision to suspend cattle exports and damage meat supply to Indonesia's population was extraordinary in its clumsiness and political and cultural insensitivity. Of the big five Asian countries, China, Japan, India, Indonesia, and Korea, India is the one with which we struggle to build effective government-to-government -government relations. Australia's success in building political and commercial links with Asia, and by political links, I mean government-to-government -government links, has not been matched by commensurate success in building up a generation of Asia literal Australians comfortable with the languages and cultures of our region. <coughs> we have blithely assumed that because of the global success of English, we don't have to make a special effort with the languages of our region. In Chinese universities and institutes of higher education, more than 100 million students are learning English. In our universities, barely a thousand resident Australians are studying Mandarin. Most of those studying Mandarin at our universities are ethnic Chinese, and most are foreign students, many of them Cantonese-speaking students seeking to learn Mandarin. University enrolments in Japanese and Indonesian are decline, declining. Fewer Year 12 students studied Indonesian last year than 40 years ago. In the 1960s, 40% of high, high school students 
studied a second language for matriculation. Today the number is 30 to 13 per cent and declining. <coughs> Australia's first Prime Minister, Edmund Barton, carried on a conversation with the Pope in Latin. For a hundred years until Rudd, no Australian Prime Minister, no Foreign Minister, no Trade or Defence Minister was able to converse officially in a foreign language. What a contrast with Indonesia, where the street sweeper in Jakarta speaks two languages, Matawi and Bahasa Indonesia. The elite in Indonesia happily speak three or four languages and don't think anything of it. Australia's expenditure on two-way cultural exchanges with Asia is derisory and a national embarrassment. Understanding Asian cultures and Asian values <coughs> is crucial if we're to engage successfully in the region in the long term. And surprisingly and inexcusably, two former diplomats, Downer and Rudd, allowed the resources of the Foreign Service to be run down. Poor leadership on Asian languages and culture and the erosion of our diplomatic resources are some of the greatest failures of our political leaders over the past two de decades. There is much unfinished business here. As a well-known Melbourne institution, AsiaLink, attached to Melbourne University uh, under the leadership of the Maya family, has been strongly recommended for much of the past decade. Now let me turn to the United States. <clears throat> Australia's security over the past 50 years has been enhanced by our alliance with the US, by the command by the US of the oceans around our continent, and by the fact that the US has been the strongest power in the world. America has ensured that we have enjoyed an essentially benign strategic environment, as indeed has much of the world. Now this is changing. Changes taking place in China, India and elsewhere <coughs> are rapidly shifting the balance of economic power towards Asia. In the 1800s, Asia's share of the world economy was over 50%. By 1950, it was perhaps 18%. By 2050, it's likely to be close to 50% again. China, as you all well know, is now the world's second largest economy and perhaps will overtake the United States in the next decade, some say much sooner. There's never been a country as big as China which has grown so fast. And China's growth in wealth and power is not so much a rise, but a return to the natural order of things. From antiquity until the end of the 18th century, China and India were the two largest global economies. They didn't have political weight commensurate with that, but they were the largest economies. Their current climb restores them to where the size of their population predicts they should be. For the time being, China is more dominant than India. The Chinese people are clever, fiercely proud, and determined to never let China fall behind again. And economic growth is naturally altering the way China sees its, its role in the world. Yet I think it's premature to assert that China will quickly become a superpower <coughs> with the reach and military strength of the United States. After an appalling century that witnessed divisive and ruthless struggles between warlords seeking to expand their spheres of control, the Japanese invasion and Mao Zedong purges, the present regime in Beijing is the best government China has ever had. But it's thoroughly corrupt and it's autocratic. It demands the obedience of the Chinese people but lacks deep legitimacy. Moreover, China's friends are mostly very small countries, many of them very irrelevant countries. Many of its neighbours, who are significant countries, Russia, India, <coughs> Japan, the Republic of Korea, Vietnam and Taiwan, don't really like it and don't trust it and several are allies of the United States. The ability of the United States to maintain its strong lead in technology and innovation and its global military reach <coughs> should not be underestimated. <coughs> it's likely that even by mid-century, the US will still be in a league of its own in terms of global military reach and ability to use force. If there should be nuclear conflict in the Middle East or on the Korean peninsula, <coughs> 
the role of the United States would be the most important determinant of the outcome. What has become clear, however, is that, it, is that the continuing rise of China and India over the next 20 years, <coughs> and perhaps the emergence of a stronger Japan, Europe and Russia too, though you wouldn't want to bet much on Europe, means that the global leadership role of the US will be increasingly contested. Moreover, expensive wars in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and Vietnam have demonstrated that America's power is not unlimited. And these wars have exposed the critical failure of the United States to develop deep cultural knowledge of the countries <coughs> to which it sent its military. The wars have also eroded the belief of those in the United States who feel America has a moral as well as a strategic responsibility to police the whole world. Already the US is less able to act unilaterally and to determine the international agenda. America will be even less able to act unilaterally if it doesn't quickly succeed in improving its dire, in improving its dire fiscal situation. Ironically, China's support for the US deficit has helped finance America's involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan. Some suggest that now is the time for us to weaken our alliance and urge the US to grant new prerogatives to China. I don't share this. Our best interests are served by a strong alliance. Indeed, the strengthening of the alliance over the past decade enhances <coughs> our opportunity to seek to constrain an aggressive US posture towards China. As a balance against the risk of possible future recklessness in the region, it's in our interest to help keep the US deeply engaged. We are a major beneficiary of China's growth, but we'll need to be astute in managing our interests as China progressively impinges on the interests of our traditional allies. A long-term task of Australian diplomacy is to reconcile our relations with China as our major trade partner with our enduring relations with the United States as our major strategic partner, and when investment is taken into account, <coughs> our major economic partner. As the primacy of the US is increasingly tested, relations among the major powers will inevitably change, and this will have important implications <coughs> for our defense policy and for our foreign policy. <coughs> we'll need diplomatic skills of a very high order if we are to successful <coughs> to manage our relations with China, Japan, <coughs> Korea, India and Indonesia and Papua New Guinea, as well as our enduring alliance and friendship with the United States. Americans are struggling to come to terms with the rise of China. Americans everywhere feel, with justification, <coughs> that the core of their economy is being hollowed out. Americans of my generation were assured they would always be the strongest, richest, and cleverest nation on earth. <clears throat> Strategically, I believe the US will remain the strongest power and the strongest military power for a long time, but major change will come in our children's lives. We have a vested <coughs> interest in a peaceful rebalancing of power, not just in our region, but globally. The United States, indeed the world, has serious unfinished business to address in world governments. So far, only modest changes have been made to the template of 1947, decided on by the victorious powers of the Second World War. I talked earlier about our failures in understanding Asian cultures. We've also behind, fallen behind in understanding our neighbours in the South Pacific. There have been other failures. We've accepted 700,000 refugees over the past 70 years. People forget, it's about 10,000 a year for 70 years. And the overwhelming majority have become good citizens. But now both sides of politics has lost a sense of perspective. The numbers of refugees fleeing to Europe are in the hundreds of thousands, not millions, while the United States has over 12 million illegal migrants. The tawdry national debate now going on about refugees diminishes us as a nation. And worse, some among us are becoming fearful. A confident society is imperiled by fear. 
fear turns us inwards. Fear will erode the confidence we must have to prosper and play our part in the community of nations. What's really worrying about this is that for the first time in 60 years, we seem to be abandoning our bipartisan consensus in favour of a bigger Australia. The world is overcrowded, sure, but Australia is not. Instead of gearing our country towards a robust and expansive view of Australia's place in the world, we are surrendering to the failure of state governments to plan for and accommodate growth. We risk defining our future not by our ambitions, but by our failures. We risk losing the notion of the future as a positive place to be. <coughs> are we shifting from willingness to risk to a preference for comfort and safety? We risk losing sight of the fact that our precarious hold on this vast continent depends on having strong defences. Australia's strategic weight in future will depend on a substantially bigger economy and that means a substantially larger population. We are deluding ourselves if we think 25 or 30 million is enough people to hold onto the vast mineral and energy resources found in this continent. Too many of our leaders don't know the second verse of our national anthem, which states, for those who've come across the seas, we've boundless plans to share. With courage, let us all combine to advance Australia fair. After he came here in 1836, Charles Darwin wrote that Australia doubtless someday will reign a great princess in the South. But he felt that Australia was for the moment too great and ambitious for affection, yet not great enough for respect. We may not yet be the great princess in the South, but international respect for the quality of Australia's achievements, including our role in international affairs, has unquestionably increased. We are regarded as a more significant and more substantial country than we were 60 years ago. Yet we've not done enough in thinking about our place in a fast-changing region. Our relative success in riding out the global financial crisis seems to have bred a certain complacency. Let me finish with a story about Sherlock Holmes and Dr. <coughs> Watson on a camping trip. After a good meal and a fine bottle of wine, they crawled into their tent. Some hours later, Holmes awake and nudged his friend saying, what do you see? Watson replied, I see millions and millions of stars. And Holmes asked, well, what does that tell you? Watson remarked, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce that it's a quarter past three. What does it tell you? Silent for a moment, Holmes then exclaimed, Watson, you idiot, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> <laughs> if we're careless as a nation, Careless as a nation, some of us feel our tent. I apologise for my croaking throat. It must be the, the flight I've just come down on. I don't have a cold or anything. Or else it's the two fine cups of coffee that Jim shout, sure, shouted me on the way. Well, whatever it was, Philip, you, I think you managed to be heard and but very well understood. Um, before I actually surrender the uh, surrender to questions, I just want to make a couple of observations because I worked very closely with Philip Flood uh, for some years and uh, the period particularly relevant, what I'm going to say was the period from 2005 through to about 2008. And he has mentioned the great uh, failings of two foreign ministers, uh, both uh, from a uh, defect background to uh, stand up for the department and to prevent uh, its um, uh, <coughs> to prevent a massacre uh, that has taken place in the last 20 years. But I, I want to say and put on record here that Philip Flood fought as hard as any bureaucrat I have ever seen uh, 
to maintain uh, a, a decent working foreign service. And the fact that uh, uh, things have not proceeded uh, as well as he and I think I and many others would have wished uh, is uh, in no in no certain, in no sense attributable to to his efforts. Um, one of our problems, I think, as a nation living in a continent, is that people assume that whenever a diplomat, whenever uh, a politician gets on a plane, Yahoo, it's a great holiday. Off you go, you fly away, and you have a great time. Well, you might have an interesting time, but if we lived in a, if, if, if Australia was 10 countries, if every, if, if, if it was a, a, a land mass uh, of the size of Europe where there are, God knows how many countries there are, the business of going to visit countries is such a normal thing to do that it isn't something that people take as a, as a privilege or as a, uh, as a perk. It's just a natural part of, of running a nation. Um, one last point on this, uh, when Australia lost uh, the security, the bid for a Security Council seat in 2006 or was um, 1996. Oh, sorry, no, 1996, sorry, I'm sorry, in 1996 we, uh, we lost Portugal, a country which had never served on the Security Council previously, a small country, but when we did the sums on how many missions Portugal had compared to Australia, I think I'm right in saying Portugal has 35 uh, embassies in, uh, in Africa uh, and of course it was also a member of the European Union so it had all of the uh, support of the European Union. We had four embassies in Africa. So other countries take um, their foreign services far more seriously. But I do want to pay tribute to Philip's efforts to defend uh, our foreign service at a difficult period. Um, okay, questions. Ben. I will just follow up on that thing, Liz. <coughs> uh, you mentioned before that uh, you saw that in the future we're going to need a lot of skilled diplomacy. I'm just wondering if you see that we've got enough talent coming up to, uh, to meet that need. Well, I, I don't doubt you've got enough talent. I mean, any of you who meet the uh, recent graduates, uh, I mean, I'm terribly impressed. Uh, it's, without being a cliche, I'm very impressed by the, 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 the quality of uh, graduates that are coming out of the best schools and universities that we have. Uh, uh, they've had the benefit of much broader education than my generation yeah. because they've come through the computer age. Uh, so look, I, I don't think there's, any, there's going to be any shortage of talent. It's a question of marshalling that talent uh, properly. Uh, so I, I, I certainly don't think there's going to be a, a lack of talent. And, uh, I mean, you see it in the University of Melbourne and the kind of graduates that are emerging here in a whole range of fields. So I, I, I just don't think there's, there's a shortage of talented young people to help us manage our diplomacy. Um, I'm just, Jamie Diana, sorry. I was just wondering, uh, in your overview of the challenges for Australian foreign policy, uh, what your views are on the Middle East and, and the occurrences there? And Arab Sting because uh, it wasn't dealt with. And if you see any threats or opportunities for Australian foreign policy in that area? Well, it's, it's a very, very difficult area, but you know, we are not a major player in the Middle East. We're always going to be a modest player, but it's, it's a very significant area for us, has been historically, and it's a significant area for us uh, uh, commercially. But I, I just don't think we're, uh, we have. Uh, the weight to influence uh, what's happening in Egypt. I'm not sure who has the weight to influence what's happening in Europe, e in Egypt. We don't have the weight to influence what's happening in Saudi Arabia. We must expect there will be changes come about in Saudi Arabia. It's, uh, it's not a secure and settled situation. There are, of course, the situation in, uh, in Iran, Iraq, uh, situation in Palestine, there are, there are a lot of extraordinarily difficult uh, issues there that, uh, that could cause us problems. Uh, I think our role is, is pretty modest, but equally I think we should be represented in all those major countries in the Middle East. We should be seeking uh, to be engaged and involved, but it's not an area uh, in contrast to the area closest to us 
where we can make uh, a significant impact. Uh, yep, yeah, I should. Thank you very much, Mr. Flood. Uh, my name is Hashim Abdulhami from Monash Asia Institute. I used to live in Malaysia for many years. And you being the former ambassador to Indonesia, you must have been aware of the fact that there were many, many illegal migrants, Indonesian illegal migrants in Malaysia. But yet Australia tried to make it something exchangeable with a Malaysian government to exchange the refugees that were heading this way. What is the policy of the present government despite the fact that the High Court rejected the arrangement? Well, the question of what's the policy of the present government, that's really a matter for the current Foreign Minister and the current uh, Prime Minister. Uh, I'm not comfortable with the policy uh, uh, I think that, that issue of uh, refugees is an extraordinarily uh, difficult one. It's, it's pretty clear by now that it would have been in uh, the interest of the present government to have maintained the arrangements that the Howard government had. I think by now they may find that uh, uh, there would have been some problems emerged with a Nauru solution, but uh, they would be in a better position than they are. There is no ideal solution that's going to solve the refugee problem. I think both sides of politics are, uh, in a sense, uh, deluding the public by suggesting that there is an ideal solution. I'd like to see uh, a regional solution. There was a regional arrangement that existed in the 1980s for Vietnamese <coughs> refugees yeah. and Cambodian refugees that are assembled on <coughs> Galang Island. It was an arrangement that worked pretty well where Australia, Canada, the United States were able to select uh, the migrants that they were prepared to take or able to select the refugees that they were prepared to take. That, ref that regional solution, uh, it certainly wasn't perfect, but it worked a lot better than uh, the schemes that are being touted now. Uh, the the so-called Malaysia solution seems to me to be very, very clumsy indeed. Sure, it's going to stop 800 people coming here. If, as I understand it, the arrangement is that we swap 800 people with Malaysia and they are never allowed to enter Australia. They are guaranteed to be kept out of Australia. Okay, that keeps 800 out, but in return, we have to take, uh, we take 4,000 refugees, presumably selected by Malaysia. But that ignores the scale of the, the problem. The scale of the problem is about 1,000 people a month, it's about 12,000. So the logic of the Malaysia solution is uh, you have to swap 12,000 people and you take 60,000 in return. I don't think that's a very acceptable deal for the Australian public. So I, I think there are bugs in the Malaysian solution. There are problems in the Nauru solution, which is a, it's a better arrangement, but uh, ultimately most of the people who went to Nauru finished up coming to Australia. But we had a say, and then we had the problems of how to return the people from Nauru to other countries. <coughs> it, it's not an ideal. It's not an ideal solution. So, between a regional solution, a Malaysia solution, and a Nauru solution, uh, I don't. I don't see personally an ideal solution. Uh, and I think this is an issue that we're not going to. It's not just an issue for the next five years. Frankly, it's an issue for the next twenty. 50, 100 years. We are a very attractive location and we're going to remain a very attractive location. We're going to have to find a way to deal with this problem that's better than the kind of debate that, uh, that's carried on now. And we need to cooperate closely with Malaysia, with Indonesia, with Singapore, with Thailand, and of course with the, the sending countries to try to devise better arrangements than exist at the moment. Yep, Des. Des Ball, Philip. Um, <coughs> my concern is uh, Islamic extremism. I'd be interested in your view of two aspects. Uh, are our intelligence services capable of 
handling it within Australia and are the other countries which are involved in combating it particularly in the Middle East but uh, also in their own countries such as the United States and the United Kingdom and a number of European countries capable of handling that in their own countries and in terms of their own foreign policy. <coughs> Well, I, I share your concern about uh, Islamic extremism, uh, extremist Islamists, is, Islamists, and uh, I think it's uh, it, it's a very it's a very very sad development that in so many countries that uh, contemporary Muslims are ignorant of the the history of Islam, ignorant of the contribution that Islam has made to uh, uh, to mathematics to calculus, to philosophy, to science. Extraordinary developments that came through Andalusia in Spain, came from Arab countries and came into, into Egypt. And that uh, it's extraordinary how many of uh, these Islamist uh, extremists have just no knowledge of the contribution which Islam has made to philosophy, to art, and to painting. There are some really fine aspects of Islamic culture. On the question of what confidence do we have about uh, our uh, security services and our police to deal with events in Australia, well, I, I have a lot of confidence. I think we've gone through a whole series of events from Olympic Games, and I was closely involved with the arrangements for the, the Sydney Olympic Games, to the Commonwealth Games, we've had heads of government meetings, We've had APEC meetings, we're going to have another two APEC meetings, we're going to have a, a G20 meeting here. We haven't had the kind of problems that have taken place in Spain or in France or the United Kingdom. I think we should pay tribute to, to what's been done by the, the Federal Police, by ASIO, by state polices. We've done a, we've done a very good job. Uh, it's not as if there haven't been efforts by some of these organisations to cause problems in Australia. Of course there have been, and we've done well to, to surmount those issues. But look, touch wood, it's not going to happen again, or it's not going to happen here. You know, it would just be appalling. You could imagine something taking place at the MCG or something. It, it would just be appalling. But so far, our, our agencies have, uh, have done very well. I applauded personally very much the legislation that, that Howard introduced that made it an offence to plan a terrorist act. And all sorts of civil libertarians said, no, this was terrible. You should only, the offence should be the performance of the act. The planning of an act should not be an offence. And I realise there are problems for, and the lawyers in the audience will know better than I, there are problems about legislation that makes uh, the intent to commit an offence an offence. But we've seen with the, the court convictions of the people who wanted to blow up Holsworthy just how far-sighted how it was and just how sensible that legislation was. And uh, I think it's given us all uh, an additional element of, uh, of security. Des's second part of Des's question is much harder to answer. Uh, how well are, and uh, it's a thesis in itself, uh, the country I know best in Indonesia, uh, alas, uh, extremist Islam is increasing in Indonesia, but it, it's, not, it's not dominating the country. It's still relatively modest. I think we have, we have a vested interest in watching that very, very closely. The last thing we want is to find Indonesia that's dominated by the kind of extremist Islam that exists in Iran or the kind of extremist Islam that exists in Saudi Arabia. And our <coughs> agencies follow that very, very closely. Australia has been extraordinarily generous to Indonesia in helping with education, in helping with uh, madrasas and other uh, 
Islamic schools in Indonesia to have some impact on the curriculum. But ultimately, this is a matter for Indonesians. It's not a matter for us, but, but we have been generous. And we have brought a lot of Islamic leaders here from Indonesia. We've, we've sought out a lot of people in their late 20s and 30s who have influential positions in the, uh, the two main Islamic organizations, in Muhammadiyya and in uh, Nadatul Ulama. And we've, we've brought teams of those people here to try to convince them that our policy is not one of objection to Islam, our policy is one of objection to terrorism. However, wherever it takes place, and whether it's Islamic terrorism or other terrorism, that we are totally and resolutely opposed to terrorism. Now I hope that's having an impact is, as those, gen those generations of 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds come through to leadership. Uh, so I think both sides of politics are really seized of this and want to make uh, a big impact. But you're asking how do we, uh, the impact of uh, terrorism in, uh, in Iraq or in, uh, in Iran, it, it's an extraordinarily difficult issue and, and it's proving uh, the digress on the question of the nuclear issue for Iran, that's, that's proving very, very difficult. It's proving very difficult for Western countries. It would be nice if, we, if there was a bit more cooperation from Russia and if there was a bit more cooperation from China. <coughs> I think China has been quite irresponsible in not being prepared to take a stand against uh, uh, what Iran is doing on nuclear issues. I think China has been irresponsible in respect of Syria and China has been irresponsible in respect of North Korea and not using its leverage on North Korea. Uh, it's a pretty hard issue. It's not easy for, uh, for the United States uh, and the other Western countries that want to have, uh, want to have a more civilized relationship with Iran and uh, want to, to try to persuade that government from what they're doing. It's a big field, they're, they're big issues, and there are probably others in this room who know more about it uh, than I do. Uh, yes. I want to hold the councilman talking about close and uh, near neighbours, PNG. I know some old PNG hands who basically say the place has gone down to burial since they've been for independence. We've poured a lot of money and a lot of energy into PNG. Should we continue doing that? I don't think we have any choice. I think yeah. we have to, to do that. PNG is very close to us and I think uh, we have to be as sympathetic as possible, but I think they're, they're testing, our, testing our friendship. It's uh, an extraordinarily messy situation. I think uh, uh, it's not something that it's easy to be uh, optimistic about, but you know, we have a vested interest. We don't want Papua New Guinea uh, assisting drug trafficking or assisting criminal effects uh, elements or assisting in people smuggling. We have a vested interest in Papua New Guinea behaving in a responsible way towards us, just as we've behaved in a very, very responsible way towards Papua New Guinea. We've run down our expertise on Papua New Guinea probably too fast. Uh, we don't have the kind of expertise in, on Papua New Guinea that we had uh, 30 years ago, and uh, that's a problem. I think we need to understand the country better and to have much better information, but I'm not sure that's going to make a lot of difference. It, it just, I think we just have to show patience. It's, uh, it's, it takes a long time to produce good governance. Uh, and I, uh, you know, talking about my experiences in foreign policy, uh, you know, I, I became terribly impressed by the importance of institutions, the importance of institutions of parliament, institutions of law, institutions of public service, and we're blessed with basically very good institutions. And it takes a long time to develop good institutions, and I think it's going to take PNG a long time, and many other countries a long time as well. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, my name is Laura Lloyd, I'm a student at Monash University. Um, I was 
wondering about the ANZUS Treaty. Um, given that from memory it simply requires the United States to inform us of a threat or impending threat um, without, uh, without uh, any physical action, do you believe that this is um, of any uh, practical benefit to us or simply a gesture of goodwill? Look, uh, as I argued in my speech, uh, I, I think the ANZUS alliance with the United States is, is extraordinarily valuable to Australia. And I think that the, uh, the efforts that were made in the early 1950s by Percy Stender at the time of the Menzies government, uh, they, were, they were brilliant acts of foreign policy. And I think we would be very unwise to, to turn away from that. I know there's a minority of Australians or a minority of experts who are questioning that, but I, I think they're wrong. I think we have gained enormous benefits uh, from our links with the United States. We've gained benefits in terms of uh, uh, military interoperability. We've gained benefits in terms of intelligence. And we've, we've gained benefits in terms of, it's, it's enhanced our weight in dealing with the region, that countries know that, uh, that we're an ally of the United States. That, that adds strength to, to our position. Uh, I'm not saying the United States will come to Australia's assistance, and, and ANZUS doesn't necessarily provide that. But there are so many things that the United States can do to help us that fall short of sending young 22-year-old GIs to come to Australia. The United States has great influence on the sea lanes of the world, on the air lanes of the world, on the capacity to influence other people's uh, cyberspace to introduce other people's uh, military. I, I think the alliance gives us extraordinary benefits. And I think we're a very foolish nation to, uh, to move away from what we have with the United States. And I think Howard was right to emphasize that and to seek to strengthen uh, the links that we have with the United States. Okay, I'm afraid this is going to be the last question. Yeah. Uh, David Brewer, this institution. What do you think of uh, the fashion for describing our foreign, foreign policy as punching above our weight? And do you think that this may have a, a tendency towards megaphone diplomacy, if that's true? Well, the answer to the second question is no. The answer to the first question, uh, it's a controversial term and lots of academics and others don't like it. But I think it's a reality, frankly. We are 22 million people. We are modest-sized GDP, modest-sized country. Uh, I think we have played a role that's, that's more than commensurate with the size of our population, the size of our GDP. And I don't think we should be embarrassed about that. Uh, we have to be careful about using that term. It, uh, it might strike a wrong chord with some of our neighbours, uh, the last thing we should be is most boastful, but uh, I think it reflects a reality. I think we have punched above our weight. I, I was fortunate to be part of the Cambodian negotiations that uh, uh, Gareth Evans led, and it involved the Permanent Five, it involved the, the countries that have permanent seats on the UN Security Council, the, the United States, Britain, France, China, Russia, it was, uh, it was very impressive, the, and, and it involved all the ASEAN countries, that unquestionably, sitting around the table with about 20 countries, Evans was the intellectual leader of the group. No two ways about it. It, it was clear that uh, you know, with his formidable intellect and his drive and enthusiasm, Evans was the man who, who got that outcome and helped to get a settlement in uh, Cambodia that stopped the parties warring. For those of us who worked with him, with him, look, we were really proud to work with an Australian Prime Minister who was uh, so talented. Uh, uh, foreign Minister. Foreign Minister, so talented at what he was doing. You would like to have been Prime Minister. Yeah, <laughs> sure. No, I really like, you know, he's not perfect. I mean, he's, you know, he's made lots of other mistakes. But uh, what he did on Cambodia was, was very, very impressive. And uh, no, I'd, uh, he was fortunate, there was an opportunity. 
after the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union uh, and the collapse of uh, the fact that Vietnam was no longer able to, to rely on support from, uh, from Russia, or not the extent to which it had previously been able to rely on uh, support from Russia, that there, there was an opportunity uh, to forge a settlement. And we were fortunate that Indonesia had come to the similar conclusion. So, and Indonesia had, and Australia had foreign ministers who got on, got on well together, and brought about this, this outcome. When the, the accords were signed, I mean, France doesn't likely say, as French Foreign Minister Dumas said, that this was a brilliant achievement by uh, Australia's uh, Foreign Minister. And Hun Sen, Cambodia's Prime Minister, said exactly the same. I'm sure his successors would love to replicate that, but I don't think we should be bashful if uh, we're able to, to be successful on the international stage. Well, we should be, be proud of it. But probably we have to be careful how often we use that expression. I know it, it just seems a bit arrogant and a bit boastful. And uh, so I have a mixed view about the expression, but the reality is it's true. <laughs>